was with the School of Engineering Sciences, so we became the School of Aeronautics and Engineering Sciences. In 1963, we became uh, the, the host for a very famous astronaut program where a lot of Air Force Academy graduates came to Purdue to earn their master's degree. And in 1965, we became the School of Aeronautics, Astronautics, and Engineering Sciences. Eventually, in 1973, we got our current name, the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And we've been moving ever since. Many of you who are alums remember when you took classes back in Grissom Hall. And in 2007, we were able to move here to Neil Armstrong Hall, along with Neil Armstrong and many other astronauts present as part of our growth. In fact, Purdue and Aero and Astro, 16 of the 25 Purdue astronauts have degrees from the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. We have one of the largest alumni bases of aerospace engineers in the country. We've given more than 11,000 degrees from the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Uh, we've been incredibly strong in both the aeronautics side and the astronautics side. And we consistently appear in the top 10 of most national rankings of aerospace engineering academic programs, both for undergraduate and graduate programs. So it's, it's a great time for the school. And right now, in fact, it's, it's obvious that we have an all time record enrollment. Uh, I'm gonna get my numbers right here. We have 1,548 students currently enrolled in the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. 960 undergraduates and 588, sorry, I got that backwards, 960 undergraduates and 588 graduate students. So obviously Purdue is a, is a destination, destination of choice for many students and, and the faculty and staff are pleased to be part of that. So that's the, the where we are 75 years into our history. So what we've done with the next couple of lecture series we've got, since we're strong in aeronautics and in astronautics, We've invited speakers to give a talk about aeronautics and one about astronautics. And today we've asked Richard Avalafia to give us a talk. I got to know Richard mostly from reading his columns in Aviation Week and Space Technology. He also writes quite a bit on Forbes. He works as vice president of analysis at the Teal Group, which is a consulting company that helps com companies with major acquisitions, purchases, et cetera. But in that role, Richard really looks at the aviation part of the industry. And he's acted as a consultant for many different companies in the US and in Asia and in Europe. So he's got a very good big picture view of aviation and aeronautics. And so from that perspective, I asked Richard to be our speaker today because he has that big picture view. He's not specifically linked to any given company. He can give us, take a look at, at where things stand today and where things are going forward. So I think I'm supposed to share. So Tammy, if you can make me the presenter, maybe you have already. I'll make sure I pull up Richard's slides. And I can share them here. This is working. And so obviously Richard took so, used his humor. Any of you have heard Richard talk before, he does have a very good sense of humor. And said, congratulations on 75 years. What will the next 7.5 bring? Trying to be a play there on the 75. But take a look for where things stand now and where are things going and give us some insight for the next several years in the aerospace industry, particularly on the aviation side. So with that, Richard, I'll stop sharing my video and I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Professor Bill. Really appreciate that. It's it, This is a great honor to, to address you all. I really, really wish I was there. You know, we'd started talking about this. Gosh, I think it must have been the better part of a year ago. And uh, it's such a great moment in time for one of the great aerospace schools of the world. And it would have been such a thrill to be there. And I'm, well, we're all dealing with the consequences of this terrible pandemic. And I suppose um, I, I'm, you know, maybe the next uh, the next big anniversary, I'll have the pleasure of addressing you in person. But in the meantime, let's make do. Um, as Bill says, I've uh, been asked with, uh, well, looking forward, you know, what's going to happen in the next few years. Actually, a bit of a bit of a misnomer. Uh, the first part of my presentation, I'm going to look at how I think things will play out in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic and what's happening now. But then the second half of my presentation, I'll give you a few perspectives on technological trends from the standpoint of an industry analyst, uh, sort of look a little bit further out beyond those 7.5 years, I hope, and uh, why it's kind of hard, why it's hard to see what's coming. Um, and Lord knows, I don't think any of us saw the set of circumstances that led me having to address you from my computer in this room in my house. So it just goes to show it's difficult. Uh, but anyway, uh, I've, like I said, I've got a bunch of numbers for you. Hopefully I won't make it too dry. 
you know, when you're in my line of work, it's an awful lot of PowerPoint. And I'll do my best to to uh, to get you through it. Next, please, uh, Bill. And uh, one after that, things I didn't think I'd see. Thank you. Um, here is the roadmap for the aviation industry. You know, walking through the entire business of aviation, manufacturing aircraft, it's really a half trillion dollar a year market. But if you just look at new deliveries without the ecosystem that supports it, without the aftermarket, without the upgrades, the stuff that bulk up to half a trillion dollars, you're looking at an industry that last year, as you can see from that bottom line, uh, the very, very bottom left was worth 179.3 billion in new deliveries. And you can see all the buckets it's broken down into um, right above that in that leftmost column. So you've got single aisle jets in the top and twin aisle jets, regionals, business aircraft. Even though military is relatively low down, it tends to be higher profit, a little more R&D intensive, a little more upgrade intensive. So there are all kinds of different buckets with different characteristics. But then you've got the compound annual growth rates that we've been seeing in the business for the previous 15 years. 2003 to 2008, all was great with the world. And my full-time job was industry cheerleader. What could go wrong? Um, then, of course, we had some difficult times in 08 to uh, 14, especially in the first part of that. Look what happened last year. We wouldn't have had that bottom right number. It wouldn't be in the red. It would be healthy and black. And uh, you can see the top right was what happened. That was the cessation of the 737 MAX production program. I should say the pausing of the 737 MAX production program. The industry took a hell of a jolt. We would have had a nice, healthy black number, probably to the tune of a 5% growth year, something typical. But single aisle jet liners, which had been the biggest single market, was dragged down to a 24% loss because of that. So going into the industry, going into the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we weren't in the best of shape because of the MAX. Um, the MAX is the second biggest aircraft program in the world, the first biggest in the US. So enormously important for this industry. Um, here's where we were going into it. Next page, please, Bill. And then we were hit by it. You know, I remember my last flight, uh, March 9th, um, flying home from LA with friends and trying to figure out what was going on and started thinking about the impact of this pandemic. And we came up with this sort of list of potential trouble. Um, and it's funny, six months later, I don't think I'd change a word on this list. The thing that's getting hit most is big, big jets, twin aisle jetliners. And that's for three reasons. One is that international traffic is getting hit hardest and most in the world aviation economy. The second is you already had a bit of a, uh, a bit of an overcapacity situation going on with twin aisle jets. And then third, you already had a fleet planning trend among the airlines to use single aisle jets whenever possible. Now, unfortunately, secondary, the pandemic is also hitting single aisle jets. And that of course is just a function of the terrible traffic numbers, but those are gonna come back faster. That is the one place you'll see the quickest recovery. Business jets, we don't know, possibly not that bad, but it's gonna be a rough year or so. Civil rotorcraft, when oil prices get hit, so do they, because frankly, the most lucrative part of the civil rotorcraft business relates to oil and gas. But the last thing there, military programs, as you saw on the previous page, um, you know, about a third of the industry, um, they're fine. The military sector of this industry is in great shape. Uh, and, you know, the one, one of the few silver linings in this difficult situation or that is that world defense spending has been quite high in recent years and looks set to stay very high. So as we say in the business, defense is defensive. And from an industry standpoint, from a job standpoint, defense is not anything at all to worry about in my view. Defense programs are in an extremely safe place. However, uh, the big drivers, the big needle movers of the business, the big jets, that's another story. Next page, please, Bill. Thank you. And this is the root of all of our problems. You know, this is the traffic chart. 
revenue passenger kilometers, that's demand for travel, and available seat kilometers, that's the capacity of the airline industry worldwide. FTKs is freight, freight ton kilometers. And this chart goes back about a dozen years, shows you that we had a bit of a crisis, as you know, in 2008, 2009, see that on the left, but nothing like what we're seeing today. Uh, you know, we seem to be more or less bouncing off the bottom. July's traffic numbers are only only 80% down relative to last year. Um, you know, it was closer to 92, 93% back in June. Uh, and May was pretty awful too. May and June were two of the worst months we'll ever see. All told, it looks like we're going to be down about 63% this year. We've never seen anything like that. So unfortunately, uh, even though I still have the highest hopes for this industry in the future, um, you're unfortunately um, right in the middle uh, <laughs> in terms of this terrible, terrible crisis. Next page, please. Thanks. So a bunch of really unprecedented numbers. The traffic decline is shown um, in long-term uh, trend terms on the right. And as you can see, even in the really worst years, the sort of 2008s, the 1990 um, downturn, Gulf War I, whatever else, typically when everything was counted at the end of the year, we lost two, maybe 3% of traffic here, we're losing 63%. I'm of the school that says, you know, when we get a vaccine, we're gonna come roaring back. It's all very well for people to talk about not traveling when none of their peers are traveling. But when you're in, a, in business, and most of us are in business, you have to compete. And when your competitors are out there traveling, you have to travel too. So I think things will come roaring back when there's a vaccine. Uh, my view is that we're going to have a full traffic recovery before 2024. Uh, IATA, the International Association, uh, the International Air Transport Association, says about the same thing. I'm a believer in that. However, it's going to be a really rough couple of years. You can see another shock to the system on the left side. Look at the world jet fleet. You know, typically in normal times, maybe 10 or 11% of the fleet is parked for whatever reason, maybe awaiting retirement, maybe awaiting a D check from the, the maintenance folks, whatever purpose. But, oh my God, we hit something like 60% of the world fleet unemployed. It's coming back a bit, slowly. It's now one third unemployed, still numbers we haven't ever seen before. Uh, Paul Krugman of the New York Times said the world economy is in a medically induced coma. And oh boy, looking at these numbers, that's kind of exactly what it feels like from this industry standpoint. Um, you know, politicians talk, but at the end of the day, this is about the vaccine and the virus. And we're just gonna have to wait till that problem is solved. And then again, I think it's gonna come roaring back Good news is, for the most part, backlogs are holding up. It's not like you're seeing airlines cancel mass numbers of jets and abandoning all hope for the future. Things are staying in place. Um, it's just, again, going to take a period of recovery before we get used to the shock and deal with the consequences of the shock. Next page, please, Bill. A couple things I like to watch. There are many things to watch. On the left, share prices of Zoom a similar platform to the one we're using, of course. And uh, as you can see, heck of a run up as people all started using and recommending and relying on Zoom seems to have softened a bit. I'm grateful for that. Maybe people were saying, all right, <laughs> we're gonna get back to meeting in person. I had my first in-person meeting with people just the other day, first one in six months. I was delighted uh, to actually see fellow human beings and talk about this industry. Hopefully that's what will happen more and more as things recover a bit and uh, as procedures get put in place and hopefully as a vaccine becomes available. On the right, however, is the Federal Reserve's view of the U.S. economy. And I'm afraid that, well, you've got similar numbers in the rest of the world. Look at that right most downward spike. It's like nothing we haven't seen. Again, an economy in a medically induced coma, seeing this worldwide. India's numbers for the quarter just came out 24% down. A lot of people were experiencing this. The only thing you can say is that because China was first, they seem to be avoiding a second wave. They're starting to come back. 
Uh, I think the message we're getting is that this is a year to 18 months uh, and maybe looking at these economic numbers, the full shock hasn't quite hit the economy yet, but it will come back. Just like everything else about our industry, it will come back. Next page, please. One thing to watch, uh, speaking of China and India, an enormous driver behind growth in this industry for the past 20 years has been the rise of China. It's become the biggest single export market in the jetliner business. And they went from just 2% of the market 20 years ago to in 2018, about 23% of world jetliner output going to China. They do, of course, have their own indigenous programs, but so far, no real progress with those. They're purely dependent upon Airbus and Boeing jets. But you can see they had issues uh, with their economy and with air travel in 2019. So one of the very biggest questions that we're following in this industry, not just the pandemic, but will China's economy and air travel demand come back, um, well, when hopefully in line with the recovery from the pandemic. It's one of the biggest questions we face. Because as you can see, one of the reasons the industry powered through the 2008-2009 economic downturn was because of China. And if they're a bit absent this time, well, that's an issue. Uh, similarly, you know, politicians, of course, on both sides of the Pacific are busy threatening economic decoupling. That's something we watch very closely because if, uh, well, the Chinese decide to coast on their own products, if trade between the West and China begins to soften or even abruptly head down, that's going to be an immediate impact to our business. So the thing you follow most after traffic and COVID-19 is China. If, uh, if you're in my line of work and if you're following the health of this industry, it's enormously important. Next page, please, Bill. Thanks. Uh, another thing we look at closely is the book to bill ratio, the number of jets that are delivered. And that's that black line there, which of course is coming down drastically this year. And the number of jets that are ordered. And for a few years, we had some amazing book to bill ratios, three to one, as you can see in the last decade, a lot of the last decade. And now, um, well, book to bill is no longer a thing because if we're lucky, we'll have about negative 800 orders this year, negative 700 net orders. That sounds bad, right? Uh, but as I told you before, backlogs are holding up better than you think. This is going to be a heart attack moment, seven or 800 cancellations net, but uh, we still have 12,000. In other words, the system is remaining in place. Airlines are not going bankrupt. There are a few, uh, but not out of business, just reorganizations. Still, none of the majors. Um, and I'm confident, I'm hopeful that a combination of aid packages, third party financing, and hopefully that air travel recovery, if it happens next year, will keep us from disaster. So no matter how bad things look from charts like this, there will be a recovery and it'll probably be pretty impressive when it happens. Next page, please, Bill. Here's what we're expecting in terms of deliveries for the industry, just looking at the, the big jetliner side. Regionals are at the bottom there. There's a reason that no American companies build regional aircraft anymore. It's never really been a great place to do business. Um, it's flat, staying flat. But we've got an interesting tail in the mix between single aisles and twin aisles. You can see single aisle output is represented by that red line. You can see the past couple decades and what we think is moving forward. Uh, and then in the, with the green line, we've got twin aisles. And for all the reasons I said before, it's gonna be a very long time before twin aisles recover, before people really want big jets. Whereas single aisles, we think they'll come roaring back along with traffic and whatever else. And frankly, because a lot of airlines plan on purchasing new single aisle jets to replace twin aisle jets. The mantra right now for many airlines is get as many point to point routes as possible. Um, serve as many destinations as directly as possible. Therefore, replace bigger planes with smaller ones when you can. And all of this is favoring single aisle jets. Next page, please. Now, the upshot of this, however, is a major challenge to Boeing 
and by extension, U.S. industry. This is the state of play in backlogs as of midpoint this year between Airbus and Boeing. And on the left, you've got the single aisles, a small single aisles below 150 seats. And as you can see, Airbus is winning because of its acquisition of the A220 from Bombardier, that was the C-series. Then to the right, you've got the 150 seat single aisle market. Strangely, the 737 MAX 8, despite all the negative headlines, is doing okay. I mean, actually, you've got it a little bit ahead of the A320neo there. And then to the right, the rightmost columns, Twin Isles, again, they're really in the dumps, but Boeing is fine in those segments. Boeing is even slightly ahead. The real challenge for Boeing, remember I said that all airlines want to bring in big single aisles as quickly as possible to replace their larger Twin Isles. Look at that big red spike. That represents the A321neo. It is a hugely popular jet. Boeing does not really have anything that can challenge it right now. That blue bar that's a tiny fraction of that big red spike is the 737 MAX 9 and 10, which is really just selling in smaller numbers and frankly is bearing the brunt of the cancellations we're seeing for Boeing jets right now. So Boeing's biggest challenge, I would argue the biggest challenge for America's aviation industry um, is how to come up with a competitive response to the A321neo. Um, you know, earlier this uh, year, late last year, they decided to shelve their plan for a jet in this class, the new mid-sized airplane, otherwise known as the 797. That might not have been the right uh, jet to do that job anyway, because it was a twin aisle jet and they're going after a single aisle. And if we've learned one thing, it's really tough to beat a single aisle with a twin aisle. Now, what will they do? I don't know, but I sure hope they do it. This is the biggest single area of concern in the Airbus Boeing competitive balance. And because, of course, a lot of American companies depend upon Boeing and international companies that are allied with Boeing, particularly in Japan, um, I think it's for their good, too, that Boeing gets out and does something. So I would look confidently forward, hopefully forward, to the idea of a new Boeing launch of some sort coming in the next couple of years. I just hope they do the right thing. Next page, please. A little glimpse of what we're expecting in this industry uh, for this year and for next year. Um, it's a bad year, I won't lie to you. I think we all know this. No black here on that leftmost column, it's all red. And that means the industry is heading for a 29% reduction uh, in output this year. And 2021, the good news is the bottom line is black. The bad news is it's kind of an artificial uh, number there. If you look at the top, single aisle jetliners in 2021 are growing 46%. A lot of that is because you've got 450 737 maxes that were already built that are gonna come back into service or a lot of them are gonna come into service next year and that gets counted as a delivery. So in terms of manufacturing activity, sadly, 21 is gonna be a red year too. Um, this is gonna be a very difficult time, except for the military front, which when it recovers from its shock is gonna have some really great growth next year and probably for the year after. So looking at who's healthy, who's hiring, the military segment sadly is gonna be the place to be. Um, I don't mean sadly in the sense that it's not a great place to work. It's just that it's not the majority of this business. Uh, but, you know, you look at such huge programs as the F-35, CH-53 head K helicopter, the resurrected F-15 over in St. Louis, the T-7, the B-21 bomber, all of these have really fantastic and strong growth numbers. The only thing dragging it down this year is, well, because of factory closures due to the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, Lockheed was going to build 141 F-35s this year. The pandemic knocked that down to about 120. That's what's causing that red number. But that'll be back strongest. Next page, please, Bill. Summing all of our views up of the market coming up in the next 10 years, what I've got here is the past couple decades, past three decades of deliveries um, in the military and civil arena 
And as I said, military looked strong before the pandemic and it looked strong after the pandemic. That's that nice solid growth blue line. Now, back in January, the red line was our civil number and things looked fantastic. As soon as the 737 MAX came back online, we were looking forward to some very solid growth. Instead, what we have is that green downward spike, a very difficult couple of years. Now, the good news is it'll feel like solid growth starting in 2022, 2023. Uh, the bad news is we're gonna be coming out of that deep valley. It's gonna be really difficult. Um, and well, I, I don't think anyone's looking forward to it, but you have my confident prediction that we're gonna come out of it and resume just as strong as we were. Next page, please. I'd like to finish up the market forecast part of my presentation with a few, well, Optimistic notes, I, you know, I think we all could use a bit of optimism. First of all, compared to the last downturn back uh, 2003, 2002 was really the last downturn. We have a much bigger industry. As you saw on the previous slide, um, it means there's a bit, cushion, bit more cushion between us and the ground. I like that cushion. It's, it's one thing when you're going from 110 billion in civil deliveries to half that. It's another thing when you go from 45 billion in civil deliveries to half that. You have a little more room with the bigger industry. Another bit of good news is that, frankly, from an airline perspective, this is kind of funny. If it weren't for the traffic, if it weren't for people not flying, this would be paradise. You've got cheap fuel, you've got great jets available at great prices, low, low, low interest rates, cash is almost free. You've got government support for most and for now. I hope that continues. Um, you've got low crew costs, because frankly, there's no upward pressure there. If you're an airline, when the traffic comes back, hopefully next year, you can decide whether to keep prices low to stimulate traffic or to restore profit or a little mix of both. So the airline industry is healthy. It, it's suffering a hell of a blow from the lack of traffic but when that comes back, they're gonna be in good shape to recover. Another bit of good news is that defense budgets and export demand are in really good shape globally. There's no pressure on them whatsoever. And the companies that build defense products primarily are in great shape too. Now, of course, the problem is they're responsible for their supply chains and their supply chain companies are getting hit, the ones that are exposed to civil. It's all about balance. People with more defense exposure are in better shape. One really positive aspect of our industry right now is that unlike in 2008, the financial sector of the economy is really in fine shape. You know, back in 2008, you had a strange mix. Main Street was okay. It was Wall Street that was melting down. Now we have the opposite. Wall Street's fine. It's Main Street that's melting down. That might seem like cold comfort, except that when it comes to financing jets, it's really important to have the finance sector intact so they can make the kind of long-term bets on financing jets. In other words, they can ride out a few months of slack demand and still agree to finance the production of new aircraft. And then finally, I think one thing that's gonna come out of this is globalization is gonna be redeemed. You know, it's one thing to be a politician and rail against globalization and free trade when times are good, but when times are bad and you're dependent upon export markets like China, um, you begin to see things a different way. And as always, I think our industry will lead the way in a rejuvenated appreciation for thinking globally. It's my confident hope. That's the first part of my presentation. The next seven, and the first uh, part is all about the next seven and a half years. Next page, please, Bill. A few observations on technology from a market analyst perspective. It's my favorite cartoon from the New Yorker there about technology. Uh, when when you all you have is a trebuchet, every problem looks kind of like a siege. But um, let's talk about technology in this business. Next page, please. First of all, oh boy, you know, you go back to the start of my career 33 years ago, and you go back even before that, way before then. And the thing that hits you is people have been really wrong a lot about our technological future. Once aircraft were going to get small, we'd all be taking air taxis everywhere after all. And then they were going to get big, the A380. And then, of course, speed, Concorde, and then water. Why not water landing? 
Why not? Why aren't we all flying in amphibians? And then, of course, vertical. The age of the tilt rotor it was coming, right? Everyone was going to get in a helicopter service. And then, of course, space. You know, there's that lovely, lovely Pan Am shuttle there for last seen in 2001, a space odyssey. And in air transport, people had all kinds of goofy ideas, luxury, retail on board. Why not? Um, look at that, just to the right middle, a piano bar uh, for the days. Sadly, that was before my time, but I'm sure they were enjoyable. And of course, wayports. This was a concept that people embraced for about five minutes back in the 70s and 80s that said that growth is going to be so huge, we'd better build just a series of giant hub airports in the middle of Kansas and then farm people out from there. That didn't work out. <laughs> None of these ideas worked out. We do not have a great track record of forecasting the future of technology and operations in this business. Your job as students is to do better than we did, because frankly, it, that doesn't look so good. So my job is to sort of guide you on the things I've learned, um, hopefully a few principles that uh, might, uh, might get you thinking about what could be happening next. Next page, please. First of all, um, well, again, it's easy to overrate the availability of flamboyant and exciting new technologies. Um, the Max will be back. It will happen. Um, and it will be a success, believe it or not. But look, there's that 1965 737-100 and it's Luf if Lufthansa launched customer colors. Doesn't really look a whole heck of a lot different from the Max of today. Doesn't look a lot different from any jet, including Airbuses today. And there we've got at the bottom all kinds of exciting new ideas. Be careful. <laughs> all I'm saying is be careful. Ideas look exciting and flamboyant and charismatic and whatever else, but they just take an awful lot longer to play out and be developed than you ever think they could. We've had that flying wing concept for a very long time. And aside from strategic bombers, they haven't been built. Next page, please. One problem is that, and I, I think a lot of engineers um, maybe miss sight of this, and God knows I have sometimes as a market analyst, is that from an airline perspective, the ultimate end user of the equipment you're building, that little, that little thin margin between RASM and CASM is just hugely important. RASM is revenue per seat mile, how many cents you get for flying mile a seat. Chasm is what it costs you to fly a mile a seat. And, you know, new technologies, when they look at new technologies, the first thing they think of is, does it raise RASM or does it lower chasm? And examples, one way to raise RASM might be to invent, well, the perfect lie flat chair, which was invented, and a really fantastic in-flight entertainment system. That's how you raise revenue for the front of your plane um, the passengers in the first class department and, and business class compartment that pay the bulkier profits. From a chasm standpoint, a lot of it comes down to turbines. There's a turbine there on its test bed. And of course, that's all about fuel burn, but it's also about weight reduction or for advanced materials. So when you get a job in aerospace engineering, I would urge you to first and foremost think, uh, am I raising rasm or lowering chasm? And, you know, there's plenty of other room for interesting jobs. But the ultimate way to job security is to be part of that process, either raise RASM or lower CASM. That's what it's all about from the standpoint of aviation economics. Next page, please. Another thing to remember is that, frankly, objects in the future may be further away than they appear. I have a citation there for a wonderful column on Slate.com that was published about four or five years ago saying, you know, everything seems like it's about to happen five years from now, but it never seems to happen. Again, this is a very conservative business, and I'm not arguing for us to take our eyes off exciting future concepts. Just be mindful. You know, our West Coast sales rep worked on scramjets in the 1960s. Um, <laughs> scramjets are still something that people would really like to do, uh, likened, of course, to lighting a match in a hurricane, but we'll get there one day, but he was doing it in the 60s. And, you know, back three years ago, you got the head at the time of 
Lockheed Martin Aeronautics saying, I believe the U.S. is on the verge of a hypersonic revolution. I've had the pleasure of meeting Air Force research scientist, Dr. Uh, Richard Hallian, his, one of his books there, The Hypersonic Revolution, Volume 1, 1924 to 1967. These things take a lot longer to play out than you ever thought. Next page, please. You know, even incremental ideas can take a lot longer than expected. I got my start in the business on the turbine side. And I remember back in 86, it was all about exciting concept, a commercial engine with a reductor gearbox to increase propulsive efficiency. And sure enough, there you've got on the left, 1986, the plan to do that Nope, that entered service, courtesy of Pratt and Whitney, was um, the geared turbofan, now known as the Pure Power, which entered service in 2016. It took 30 years. It was a lot longer, again, than expected. Next page, please, Bill. And you know, the other thing to remember is that, boy, I've seen a few of these technological dead ends. They happen. Um, I'm a believer in supersonic business jets happening one day, but the idea of commercial scheduled supersonic transports, I think that was kind of a dead end. There it is, Concord. When I got my start in the turbine business, lower left, the prop fan was the thing of the future, the unducted fan. Um, <clears throat> Indianapolis, I believe, did some work on that, 578DX. There was also the GE36, neither went anywhere. They look scary as heck. I'm not so sure they ever will, but the idea sure seemed good at the time. Um, to top right, a nuclear airliner, because God knows in the early 60s, we had a nuclear bomber program. I believe it was the NB-36. It was going to happen. Um, and maybe it's for the best that it didn't. I think we all think that now. The, uh, the idea of an airborne nuclear reactor perhaps isn't the soundest idea. Um, single stage to orbit, uh, Ronald Reagan and the, uh, I believe it was the Orient Express, he called it. Um, another great idea that realistically, I don't think is happening anytime soon. And then my favorite in the middle, that is a genuine stamped envelope from Rocket Mail, U.S. Postal Service Rocket Mail. The scary thing about Rocket Mail is that it actually happened. They had a test flight with a rocket to deliver mail. This, I believe, was sometime in the early 60s. For some reason, it didn't quite take off, uh, as it were. So anyway, the lesson here is that, you know, if a technology either proves just overblown or doesn't do its part to actually contribute towards an end goal, like enhancing revenue or lowering costs, it can fall by the wayside and be consigned to the Museum of Aeronautical Oddities. And there's plenty more where these came from, I'm afraid. Next page, please. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as I believe it was a character in a sitcom, I think it was 30 Rock said, uh, technology can be cyclical, which sounds goofy, but it, believe it or not, it happens. Uh, new ideas can come and go. And the idea of the more electric aircraft, the idea that, of course, aircraft systems should be powered by electricity rather than hydraulics and pneumatics. Uh, look at that, that was on the B-29. The B-29 had a more electric architecture, and then it took, um, well, more than half a century to come back on the 7A7. The A350 doesn't have it. Have it. Um, I don't think it's going to be hugely popular for a while because, of course, it gave us some of the hugest problems with the 7A7, including the, the battery fires and whatever else. Um, I'm not so sure it won't come back, but I'm not so sure that it will. So technologies can recur. It's really difficult to know for certain when a technology takes. Next page, please. One thing I would advise you, um, and this is my tribute in, in search of a siege, hammer in search of a nail. I'm a market analyst. I'm sorry, I apologize for that. I tend to look at markets. I tend to be almost too much of a market fundamentalist but I like to look at markets as an indication of whether or not there's a demand for a product. And this is the chart that shows the effect, the, or the desired goal, which is to move people to 
short ranges and small cheap air vehicles. This is the chart for small piston helicopters and small turbine helicopters, single engine turbine helicopters. Um, worth about 350 million a year. Otherwise known as something that really doesn't show up in any of the other charts I do, it's tiny. There are now 250 people designing air vehicles for this market called Air Urban Air Mobility. Um, will urban air mobility stimulate this market with new technology, with batteries, with uh, sense and avoid, with uh, autonomy, um, with, I don't know, enhanced safety systems? I hope so, maybe. Uh, they could quintuple, maybe even grow this by 10, in which case you're looking at a $3 billion market. There's going to be carnage here, <laughs> is my point. Uh, 250 people all going after a market that looks like this, that may or may not be stimulated, there's going to be carnage. Now, are there going to be exciting jobs developing new systems and technologies? Yes. Just be super careful because a lot of these are going to fall by the wayside. Next page, please. My final, final page, and then I'll turn over to questions. Um, and this is my sort of, what do I know chart? Uh, around the time that the Purdue School of Aeronautics and Astronautics was being created, 1945, I believe, uh, according to Bill there, very, very interesting time for aviation. And I picked up this book. I didn't pick it up in 1945, not that old. Uh, I picked it up in Spain a couple of years ago, and it was published in 1945. It's called Wings After War. And um, as you know, World War II, like, any conflict was a, a tremendous catalyst for technology development. So much happened, including that more electric architecture on the B-29 that I showed you a moment ago, a lot happened. But the author of this book, um, which is fascinating, uh, included this chart to the right, and you can see it, but it shows technical progress and how he's concerned about technical progress plateauing in 1945. I mean, you know, we, it's amazing to think, but this guy probably thought a bit like I did that maybe it was really hard to see what would happen next. And he charted out where aviation had come from. It had come from biplanes and, you know, uh, sop with camels all the way up to jet engines, the early days of the jet engine. I mean, just an incredible first well, first, uh, what are we looking at? 42 years, 1903 to 1945. And it was very hard for him to see what would happen next. And of course, the rest is history. Since Purdue School of Aeronautics and Astronautics was founded, it's been an amazing revolution in jet, in, in jet transport, in military technology, and in, in the astronauts your school produced. I mean, it's amazing. But here we are, 1945, and this learned gentleman produced this chart saying, I don't know where growth is going to come from. So I'm going to end on exactly that note from 75 years ago. I don't know what's, where it's going to come from, but I take solace from this chart and from this book. And I'll tell you, it's going to be exciting. It's going to see some really fast growth. And uh, I wish you all the best in experiencing the very best of that growth and that excitement. With that, I'll turn back to Bill to moderate any questions. Great, thanks, Richard. Let me turn my video back on. So it's very slow. There we go. So what we'd like to do, for those of you who are participating, we've got the Q&A box. That's a great place to put those. Those will show up, and I can actually read those to Richard. So you can type those in there. I was listening with interest, Richard. One of the things that I've got a research product on, actually, is in urban air mobility. And I, I don't think you were saying it's a, it's a poor thing to be looking at. You're saying, hey, watch out. This is going to be as big as it might be. So thinking about that and thinking about my specific research project, what do you think are the major limits? Do you think it's just that the market doesn't exist or the market exists and the technology is too big a leap? Well, you know, all of my favorite principles are wrapped up in urban air mobility. Um, and I think the most interesting aspect of it is that there are some really exciting things that need to happen whether it's sense and avoid for autonomy, whether it's in 
batteries, of course, and quick charge technology, whether it's in lightweight, advanced engineered structures, there's so much happening. Um, and I have no doubt, I really don't, that there's going to be some market stimulus that produces some winners here. I have no doubt about this. Um, but um, relative to the number of people developing these, yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. So it's that relationship between people who want to get into it. I mean, to be brutally honest, it might resemble the development of railroads in the second half of the 19th century. A lot of people developing railroads went bankrupt. <laughs> in the second half of the 19th century, they also produced, yes, the most amazing infrastructure ever known, uh, the railroad. And in my world, my worldview, I guess we'll see some amazing things come out of urban air mobility technologically, but there'll also be some carnage too. So it's going to be fascinating. Um, on the other hand, you know, a lot of the money coming into urban air mobility is from outside of the traditional investment pool, investor pool in our business. And I'm thrilled for that, right? <laughs> I'm really happy to see cash come into this business. And, and, and I, hope, I hope their investments are, are repaid in the form of these new advanced engineered structures, in the form of new batteries, in the form of fence and avoid, whatever else. Uh, it's going to be really fascinating to watch. Great, thanks, Richard. We're getting a few questions. Let me go ahead and read you some here. Um, a student is wondering about what the aero industry would do if another event like COVID-19 happened. And I think maybe it's what, how soon could we weather it? <laughs> maybe it's, the, it's hiding behind that question. Yeah, you know, you get into a macroeconomic question there, don't you? I mean, at this point, the various rescue packages, well, well first of all, let's make the assumption that it's not just our industry. And it's a good question, but it's not just our industry. It's every other industry on the planet that's going to continue in a medically induced coma in the event of a, a second wave or a, a second pandemic or a, a, a giant earthquake, whatever whatever exogenous shock you'd like to think about. Um, we're right now at about eight or nine percent of GDP going into coronavirus rescue packages. That's good. It's keeping the economy from collapsing. It's keeping us from mass unemployment. That's good. How much more debt can the world's economies take? This fast becomes a macroeconomic question. Um, and it's one I hope we don't have to answer. I hope it will play a role in the recovery, right? Getting people moving again and that stimulus that aerospace provides should, should help us out there. Oh, absolutely. That's the strongest argument for keeping everything in place. I completely agree with that. Um, but a second wave, I, you know, or a second shock, I think it's going to be a, it's it's almost a more of a question for your local Federal Reserve Bank, either here in, in Europe or Japan or China, because uh, we're just gonna have to keep paying until there's the recovery from that. So, uh, oh boy, let's hope it's not the case. And let's, let's hope that when the recovery comes, everything lo looks like it does now and we can all benefit from it. Great, here's another question from, from one of the audience. Do you think there could be a situation that could suddenly come about that would stimulate major design changes like the blended wing body or flying wing that you showed? Or is just the, the time so long to be supported by something that like, you know, a trigger that would force that? Uh, I'm trying to answer the question that's written there. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, obviously, historically, fuel prices have served as a very big catalyst for technology development in the aviation business. As a matter of fact, that geared turbofan I showed you a moment ago was launched in the very month, almost a statistical quirk, but not unrelated, the very month that we had the world's record for spot market prices for West Texas fuel. It was July, 2008. Um, and it just goes to show that the shock of higher costs can really, you know, well, catalyze technology development. Um, I'm, it's possible the green movement plays such a role. If you have um, the way a lot of Northern Europeans think begin to spread around the globe, maybe because of natural disasters related to climate change or whatever else, I'm just talking theoretical here, of course, um, maybe that will serve as a catalyst. Short of that, I don't know because, you know, so much of the technological improvements, the hard work that's made is fundamentally incremental. It's never the sort of Jack Northrop flying wing. I mean, that happened back in the day, but does it really happen now that much? No, it's a, it's a team of really brilliant people working on 
a, a wide variety of technologies that come together and enable things like a geared turbofan or who knows, maybe a trapezoidal wing or whatever else. So it's it, the answer to the question is fuel prices, but maybe environmental factors too, I think. No, it's actually a question I had for you. Could climate change push something? You know, those are my questions that we didn't have these. So thanks for answering that. Have any of the companies taken this sort of pause to actually look back and say, hey, maybe I could invest in research now since we're you know, not delivering product or we've got a backlog. Are they, are they working on R&D? Are you familiar with that? Do you know? Yeah, we look at IRED, uh, independent research and development, uh, as distinct from contract R&D, which is provided by NASA or the Department of Defense or the European Union. Non-contract IRED is hugely important as a metric. And um, we're going to, you know, we're going to be looking back and judging who the good actors were and the not so good actors. And Airbus, for example, I'll give them very high marks. They are holding up their IRAD spending very nicely. I'm not really sure what they've got in the gestational pipeline in terms of new aircraft development, but they're spending on it. So maybe they've got something up their sleeve or maybe they're spending it on a variety of other improvements um, along the lines of what you're talking about. Boeing, I'm a little concerned about, uh, gotta tell you, because frankly, the requirement for developing that mid-market jet, this would be the time to make those kind of forward-looking investments, but instead they've announced a 25% cut to IRAD. I'm really concerned about that. Um, everyone else we're looking at, so far they haven't made big cuts, but they are talking about the, the risk of having to do it. So I think a lot, to, the answer to your question, I think a lot depends upon the timing of the recovery. We're hoping that when the recovery happens or that as a sort of bridge to that recovery, they keep engineering and design teams in place. Yeah, so kind of along those lines, one of the things people work on is electric airplanes and it looks viable in the trainer market in that sort of place. So one of the questions, talking about buy in particular, but there's a lot of companies, Petrostrel, several doing this, so what's your view of that and where does it fit? Because for a while that was driven by low cost for training and a perceived pilot shortage. Where does that fit now in the bigger scheme of things, the electric airplane? Yeah, it's an interesting one. You know, there too, like urban air mobility, a lot of the cash is coming from outside the industry rather than within, you know, um, Pipistrel for a very good example. You know, you have people willing to invest venture capital money, whatever else. I hope it continues so far, you know, there's always cause to be concerned, but so far, because Wall Street is holding up, I'm hoping that the investment money for interesting, far-looking research like that also holds up. And when it comes to the bigger stuff beyond the trainers, beyond the, you know, the sort of caravan that Magnix is doing, which kind of intrigues me, I'm, I'm, I'm rather impressed with that Magnix caravan. Um, I, we're also looking very closely at, at, at hybrid and what companies like say, uh, you know, Boeing's Aurora Flight Sciences and, and folks like that are doing. And I hope that continues too, because when it, I don't think electric is gonna get there for a long time for the bigger jets, just for reason, battery density, and of course, all the other issues. Um, but hybrid offers a great deal of promise uh, for even the 2030s. So I'm hoping that pipeline of cash continues. So that might relate to another question where somebody, uh, just basically what what aviation technology development that's going on right now really looks promising to you is it the hybrid what's what's the thing you see out there going that's most likely i mean you said it's hard to predict so i'm going to ask you to do it anyway <laughs> yeah i mean uh, a lot of some you know, hybrid is unquestionably the, the big long-term long payoff possibility um the big question i think is in, in the world of turbine design do we have what's coming next in the world of turbines and I think it's pretty clear that there's, it's gonna stay con relatively conventional, but with a gearbox for another generation. So Rolls-Royce Ultrafan, does that happen? Does GE start a program to do, well, uh, a geared engine of its own? What happens on that front? What's happening in the world of integrated propulsion systems and basically getting to even higher bypass ratios beyond 10, 11, 12? That's the stuff that kind of excites me. There's a lot of new things happening in the world of advanced materials with thermoplastics that I think is 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 thrilling in its own way. Uh, you know, when the B21 program comes out of the, the black, when it gets declassified, I'm hoping to see some interesting stuff come out of there. You know, a lot of the stuff we're harnessing now came out of the, the B2, the F22, the B22 programs. 
back from the, uh, the late 80s and early 90s, especially in terms of materials. So there's all sorts of stuff out there. Um, and, you know, who knows what the next big breakthrough would be. I, the thing I've always sort of been intrigued by is a trapezoidal wing transport with uh, really ultra high bypass engines under it. But of course, there are a lot of people smarter than me who probably have a different view of that utility. And so somebody actually asked specifically about hydrogen, maybe thinking about what we're talking about, you know, here, less emissions, more efficient, et cetera, less environmental impact. What, what, do you, what do you think about hydrogen? I know Airbus has been doing some more visible stuff. Other people have looked at it. Yeah, and of course, there's all sorts of challenges in, in handling that material on board, both for fuel and fuel cells. It is intriguing. I mean, I remember back in the 80s when I started, um, I believe Airbus even had some kind of A300 test bed, but of course it was all propulsion system and no payload of any sort. Uh, I, I think they've probably made a lot of progress since then. I, I'm that, that falls under the bucket of, you know, show me after 30 years of watching, seeing some interesting talk. Um, I'm really intrigued by it. I, I, I hope it happens. Um, but obviously it's been, it's been a long path. So you talked a little bit about commercial supersonic and you were hesitant about it. And, and, and for some understandable reasons, I think a lot of us would like to be more optimistic if we can get the cost down. But then people are all also talking about these hypersonic, right? So uh, our, our friend out at SpaceX has, has talked about hypersonic travel and, and Boeing. Some of the people we know at Boeing have, have got a nice uh, Boeing logo looking transport. Is there anything in that in, in traveling at that kind of speed for people? You know, I sure hope so. And again, this gets back to that uh, that wonderful curve from 1945, you know, when the school was started, you know, who could tell, right? And if we were to draw a similar curve today and show it flattening and, you know, the the person who does my, my job or something like my job 75 years from now says, well, this guy clearly missed the hypersonic revolution that kicked in right there. And I'm hoping that's the case. Now, having said that, over here in Washington, Everyone is focused upon hypersonics weaponry. Uh, it's the way of offsetting the perceived Chinese advantage uh, and the pivot to Asia and everything like that. And uh, of course, all that, uh, you know, that, that, that comes with risks of its own. But there's an awful lot of cash going into the weaponization of hypersonics. And some of that, of course, is boost guide, you know, where you, you fire an ICBM and it comes back and it's maneuverable. And that's not really the same, of course, as the sort of systems like scramjets that you need for hypersonic transport, but there's also programs designed uh, to, well, air launched systems that are designed to get miss cruise missiles to hypersonic sonic speeds using things like scramjets. And if they can get there, then yeah, I mean, within, I would think within 20 years, there's no reason it couldn't be commercialized. The problem is that they're not there yet, even for that kind of cruise missile capability. It's going to take some time. I'd be rather surprised if something were weaponizable, deployable, whatever the correct verb is, until the 2030s on that front. In which case, if you accept my timeline, we're really talking about something potential in the 2050s. Um, and again, the, the future me looking back and showing that curve, you know, um, will say, ah, there it is, 2050. Still, there's something to it. And it's fascinating to watch. We're getting close on time. How are you on time, Richard? Are you willing to stick around for a couple more minutes or? This is the best part of my job. So, okay. thank so I'll, I'll keep going. And I, I know some, some of the students, it's late in the day, but if the students have to go, we are recording it. So you can come back and, and listen a little later if you're willing to stick with us for a little while. Um, so a couple of questions. I'm trying to combine a few here is they're similar. So people are interested in trying to decide, well, you know, I've got feelings about going to the commercial industry versus the, space, uh, the defense industry. Are there some trends in defense industry we should be watching out for that, that says, oh, wait a minute, this might be a concern in the future, that, that the market will be smaller or the market will be bigger? So just some thoughts about what to look for if you're, if you're making those decisions as a student. Sure. You know, um, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on defense. I think, unfortunately, you look at the history of the world and it's hard not to be, you know. Um, a lot of my years just getting started in this business were late 80s, early 90s, end of the Cold War. And pretty clear we were kind of taking a holiday from history, unfortunately. Um, I tend to be bullish on defense, as you can see from my numbers. Now, some, some macro trends. Uh, first of all, I believe 
inhabited crude systems are going to be with us for some time, but more and more of the value of the defense budget is going to go into broader systems and architectures. And, you know, one of the most exciting aspects, maybe this gets back to another question, but the loyal wingman type program, the Skyborg type program, the uh, air power teaming concepts, you know, for years we've been looking at um, remotely piloted vehicles, UCAVs, as a, a fighter surrogate, that was the wrong way to look at it. They're actually adjuncts to fighters, something that ties into a network where they cooperate with combat aircraft. A lot of money going into that, but of course that's a different discipline, isn't it? You know, a lot of it is just creating the architecture that ties these systems together. But there's also gonna be some very interesting work for sort of small air vehicles that are more robust than traditional UAVs but nothing like the expense and, and, and size of traditional piloted, directly piloted crude platforms. There's going to be an interesting field in between that I think will be watchable. And the other thing is I, I think more and more, obviously, as you design systems, onboard systems with modularity in mind and open architecture in mind, there'll be a lot more potential for working on discrete systems that are plugged in and plugged out of various platforms. That's going to be really exciting. So those are the, the major trends among many hypersonics, of course, again, that I look at in the defense business, but bullish on defense, lots of exciting stuff happening. So I'm trying to, again, trying to combine a couple of thoughts from some, some related questions here. I, I think this one is a good summary, All right? So after 9-11, which was a horrible blow to the industry, uh, we, broader public, responded and we put TSA in place with the intent of making everybody safer. And that had some lag effects on the recovery of traffic just because it became harder to fly. Do you see anything like that coming out of COVID? Do you think that we may end up going through lines where we're taking our temperature and spitting in a cup? Or I'm sort of joking because a lot of the Purdue students and myself included when I came back from a trip had to go do that <laughs> to make sure we could come to campus. But is that something that's in, that people are thinking about in this recovery? Have you thought about it in your recovery trend for the traffic coming back? Yeah, you know, what's really interesting, um, there's short and long term. First of all, if, it, if it's obvious that a vaccine is going to be further out than this year, which it will, you know, <laughs> it's really a mid next year story. It's possible that a combination of rapidly available cheap instant testing plus an effective post-infection infection therapeutic drug would be just as effective as a vaccine. In other words, we're sure that you're not you're getting on this plane without it, or even entering the airport. And if you do get it, by the way, thanks to Remedy Severe Plus Plus Plus, you don't have to worry about dying. It'll just be a flu. Um, that would help us get back to traffic very fast. If we had that combination, so I think it's hugely important. Now, the, the second part of that, uh, that that rather interesting question, I think embedded in there, are long-term cultural trends, just like we've seen with TSA since 9-11. And, um, you know, for those of us who fly to Asia, who have the pleasure of flying to Asia, you know, you get used to the sight of people wearing masks in public places a lot more. And um, that might be a feature of the landscape for a lot longer and wiping down surfaces more. And, not all of this is unwelcome. I mean, at the end of the day, we all have horror stories of flying on some grimy old DC nine that had been and had been seen a seen a few uh, too too, uh, too many months between its uh, its uh, its upkeep interval. Um, but there could be just a lot more of that, both as a way of restoring confidence in the system and because just just people, you know, just acquire that 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 habit as a, as an acclimatization thing. So I would getting back to your question. I think there's more promise here than threat. You know, I don't want the, the onerous drag associated with these, these, these burdensome things at the check-in lines. On the other hand, hey, think of it as an opportunity to get back to traffic faster than if we depended purely upon a vaccine. Sounds good. So just sort of joke too, I used to work for McDonald Douglas like we talked about before we got started. So I was always in the habit of looking at the DC-9 and the MD-80 to see if the airplane was older than I was when I got on board. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, so there's a question here that's kind of interesting. You know, you mentioned it, just going a single aisle and bigger single aisle and making more point to point and, and, and you know, Boeing, that's the, the sort of the impetus they gave for doing the 787 the way they did it. Do you see another shift 
that like somehow moves us back given where we are? Do you think it's just more of the of the disparate point to point routes? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and um, there's two reasons you do it. Three reasons you do a twin aisle. One is, of course, range. That had historically been the reason to go to a twin aisle. Um, and with the new generation of single aisles, you've got well into transatlantic, which takes away a lot of the city pairs that you would have gone to a twin aisle with. It's no longer just continental and Iceland air. It's now a lot of people. I flew an Air Canada 7-3 Max, of all things, from Heathrow to Halifax the other summer um, before all the, the bad stuff happened. But you're going to see an awful lot of routes like that. But still, beyond say 5,000 nautical miles, you're going to stick with the twin aisle. The second reason is if you feel absolutely certain that you need the capacity and, you know, there are routes that will always be high capacity. New York, London, that's not going to a single aisle anytime soon. And the good news is when the single aisle routes proliferate, eventually they'll start to thicken again. I mean, we finally have the ability here in, um, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, to fly direct Portugal, one of my favorite countries in the world. Um, they started it up with an A330 a couple of years ago. Eventually, there'll be enough people like me who love Portugal and you know, they'll get a bigger plane. Um, and then another, although that already is a twin alsum, but you get the idea. The point is these routes proliferate and then they thicken. And then the third reason, of course, is belly cargo. And um, that's sort of an interesting feature of the landscape right now. You've got so many wide bodies taken out of the mix that there's a shortage of belly cargo, which is why everyone's doing these conversions, because they don't have enough belly cargo capacity. And it could be that more airlines switch to a belly cargo model that flips them back in the direction of twin aisles. So those are the three things that could get us back to a, a higher mix. But it's going to take some time before the current trend plays out. And that was one of the earlier questions that I skipped. I just I caught it here, the, the freighter market, right? So the freighter market's a, a small slice, but a hugely important slice here. And so, you know, as we've got all these airplanes parked and semi-retired, are they going to come back into passenger service? Are they going to go to conversions or what do you think that goes? Well, ask me again in 2023, right? Because at the end of the day, that's if you take my assumption that traffic comes back in late 23, early 24, um, then we'll know what gets mopped up in the surplus capacity, but it's a good question. You, you, you think of it in terms of feedstock for cargo conversions and historically uh, cargo conversions at about two thirds of the market and then one third new build. Um, could it be that the supply, the feedstock uh, shifts that more to an 80-20 model for some years? Yes, absolutely. I think there's a very strong argument for that. Uh, that's going to be super interesting to watch. And again, it's a function of, of how quickly that feedstock gets mopped up. Uh, it's also a function of fuel prices to a certain extent, although the cargo market is a lot less sensitive to fuel prices because the hourly utilization and cost structure just isn't the same as with passengers. But it's really a question of feedstock. So in your uh, second half of the talk, you talked a little bit about the technological progress that we see. Let me phrase it that way. I don't know the way the question's worded, but I'm, I'm gonna analyze it here a little bit. I don't think you were arguing we shouldn't be looking at all those crazy ideas. I mean, that's what we do in research because you need 20, 50, 100 crazy ideas before one actually breaks through. Exactly. But is that because it's really technological challenge going from like the low TRL to the high TRL? And that's what DARPA always calls the valley of death. You get a great idea, it works in the lab, and then there's a gap. Is that a technology challenge or is it a business limitation or what's the mix there? Well, that's an interesting question. It's what is the mix? I mean, you look at failure in history, and it's it's one of those, you know, it's either grossly oversold technology that just doesn't mature as expected or proves too costly, or it's that there's no market. Um, and it's 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 just impossible to put a metric. I, I you know, and and for your comment, absolutely. Um, it doesn't mean you should be discouraged. You've got to have 50 ideas for one to work out. Just expect that some will be dead ends, some will be disappointments, some will take a lot longer to mature than others. Um, you know, you look at some of the most high profile failures in this business, you know, I, I, with, with a huge degree of tragedy, I will say Concord, because I think from an engineering standpoint, from a, an aviation lover standpoint, nothing like Concord, 
Uh, but on the other hand, oh boy, there's no market. <laughs> there really weren't enough people willing to walk up to the counter with a Samsonite full of cash and say, I'm going to Buenos Aires, here's my $12,000. <laughs> This wasn't happening. So what's the mix? It it might be 50-50. You know, I, I expect it's heavily weighted towards a TRL issue with military issues when it comes to the military. Hypersonics is the story of that. Not very long ago, I had the pleasure, one of my last flights, um, it was actually, yeah, it was towards the end of last year, made it to Wright Pat, do a little pilgrimage to the museum there, as I'm sure many of your students have been. If you haven't been, you gotta go. And they've got an XB-70. You know, Cecil, the C6 Sea Serpent propelled by zip fuels. And of course, there was a great example of a grossly oversold technology. With, with the military, there's always a market. That's why they started funding it, right? Uh, it's always a TRL thing. On the commercial side, then, maybe it's almost always, you know, a market issue rather than a TRL thing. Military, the other way around. Maybe that's the way to look at it, perhaps. All right. Let me get a couple more questions in here. I probably missed a few, but. There's a few that have popped up a little bit about the space industry. I think that's it's, it's adjacent or maybe maybe it was further away from your normal area of business. But now we've got the spaceship company, you know, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic. There's going to start to be sort of a pseudo tourist market there. And so it kind of bleeds over some of your air of expertise. What are your thoughts on that segment of the aerospace industry that's Got some features of what we've done in commercial aviation, but really still is a space endeavor. Yeah, you know, very exciting, of course. Um, sadly, I'm not the space person at Kiel. We've got a really good one. Um, and I'll just channel him for a moment. Um, at the end of the day, what you're seeing now is a, a terrific example of public-private partnership, because of course, a lot of the cash for these new, you know, blue origin type ventures and the horizon, whatever else, coming from the government. Um, can we make the transition to a consumer economy or a business economy in space, other than, of course, you know, telecom, satellites, whatever else? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think, I think my my colleague uh, Marco Casares is fairly uh, optimistic about the concept of space tourism. I, I don't know enough to know. All I do know is that right now the revolution is happening because of public-private partnerships, rather than a direct transition to a, a proper commercial economy. Okay. Hey, Richard, we're coming up on 515, so I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap things up. But thank you so much for participating with us today. I had a great time. I've got, I've got 25 or 30 questions I could ask you, but I'm glad you got to ask the students the questions. As always, I love hearing you talk, and thank you very much. I don't, we can't give you the big applause, but I will at least applaud in my office on behalf of the 100 and so <laughs> attendees we've got. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for helping us with our celebration here, Richard. Thanks so much, Bill. And congratulations to you and, and all the best to your students. And uh, I hope they have the pleasure of visiting when, when circumstances allow. We will, we will get you here as soon as we can. Hey, take care, Richard. Everyone, thank you so much for participating this evening. Have a great evening. And we have another talk tomorrow. Eric Stalmer, who's the uh, Commercial Space Flight Foundation CEO, president, is going to give his version of this talk, thinking about commercial space flight and the opportunities there. So. If you have time tomorrow, uh, please join us then. And you're welcome too, Richard. I think it's 11 a.m. If you want to join in for that, you're welcome to join us too. All right. Great. Thank you, everyone. I think we're going to wrap up. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much.